So we are joined now by uh, my good friend, uh, Hugh Cullimore. And uh, for people, uh, just as some background, Hugh and I have an unusual distinction relevant to this podcast that we have both worked at the same time together in a brewery and in a war museum. Um, and also we have shared a house and we have gone to a um, regional Burning Man together. Um, we are a member of a bicycle club together. Uh, and once Hugh threw a birthday party for my dog so that he could get the girl who lived across the road, sorry, the young woman who lived across the road to come and hang out with him. And I would note that it was not actually my dog's birthday. Um, but, uh, so Hugh, welcome to the show. I've completely forgotten about that. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> no, thanks anyway. for having me. <laughs> no worries at all. Thank, thank you for joining us. Now, the reason in particular we brought you on isn't just to reminisce about um, house parties of yesteryear. Uh, uh, but, Hugh, you have uh, been through the Murrayville Tank Graveyard. Um, and I'm going to put the slideshow up now and start scrolling through it. But if you could set the scene for the uh, the viewers and the listeners about wh where the hell Murrayville is and, and what is there for the tank enthusiast. So Murrayville is a tiny little town uh, just on the Victorian side of the Victorian South Australian border. It's on the Mallee Highway um, between a little town called Uyen and the South Australian border. There is pretty much nothing in the town. So sorry for any Murrayville residents that uh, I might have just offended. Um, but yeah, there's pretty much, it's a typical little Aussie town. There's a pub. There's like a servo, um, but on the way out of town, um, there's a newly built servo um, or, or a petrol station for uh, non-Australian viewers. Or, or um, gas station for the Americans, yep. Gas station, yep. Um, and this one's a uh, an unattended one, but it's now, on the I've site never, of where... I've never encountered an unattended service station before, so can you just, I think people can grasp the concept from the name, but just walk us through what's involved to use it. Yeah, so um, it's just a couple of big tanks, and you can see the shot that just came on screen um, of the prices uh, of the petrol. And, yeah, you just sort of turn up, you uh, take the fuel that you need, you pay with your credit card or your debit card, and you drive off. Um, so I think they'll probably be, we'll be seeing more and more of those through rural Australia. But um, so for the last 10 years, sort of my family live in South Australia. I studied and worked in Canberra. So I drive between the two a couple of times a year, and Murrayville's on that journey. Now, as you're passing out of Murrayville on the Victorian side, there was a field, and this field had tank remnants, car remnants, all sorts of machinery. But just recently, with the building of this, this unattended service station, they've, they seem to have ordered the tanks. So they're now all in a line. So as you park up to get your fuel, you're... Uh, flanked by by these six shelves, um, and uh, you can walk around them now. And you know, previously they were sort of inaccessible; they were sort of blocked in by the scrub. But yeah, now you can stick your head in, take photos, and it doesn't feel like you're trespassing on anyone's land. Um, look, as you can see from the photos, they're they're pretty uh, they're pretty beat up, but. Um, you know, did there used to be more salvages. tanks. Did there used to be more tanks in the tank graveyard out there? I've heard stories that there used to be about two hundred or something. Look, I've heard those stories, but for the past sort of ten years that I've been driving through, it seems to have been these core six. Um, but um, there are plenty of parts as well in the field behind. Um, so you see, like, I think I've got a couple of pictures of them that will come up at some point. But yeah, there's plenty of parts and stuff floating around, so it certainly wouldn't surprise me if there were more. And sort of anecdotal evidence that I've heard is that um, Second World War training crews um, were trained out that way. And sort of at the end of the war, uh, you know, a lot of these tanks were sort of given to farmers for scrap or... or um, Uses tra tractors or, engine or tractor engines. Yeah, so they could, yeah, uh, that so sort they could of do, do, do uh, guard, uh, work around the farm. Now, Hugh, my looking at your photos, uh, I mean, the M3s are unmistakable. Uh, yeah. And in fact, on, right now on screen, we've got one that's even got its top turret on. Um, 
the other one I could definitely spot was Matilda from the side skirts. Did you is is, is there anything there that you recognise other than being uh, M3s and Matildas? That's that's about it. Yeah, I mean, let's let's not be too um, you know hard on it because the M3 is an absolutely bizarre tank, and uh, Matilda's a great tank, and uh, a pile of them anywhere. And you know you're you. You're having a go at the condition, but I've seen museums working to recondition um, tanks, and they're working from less than these. Yeah, you know, often they're oh, yeah. working from a, a rectangle of rust, and these are still the chassis are still very I mean, recognizable. The, 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 track, the tracks are still on them, and the turrets are still on them. It's, yes, you need to mm. fit everything out, else out inside. But um, I'm, I'm sure somebody will be coming along and uh, in the middle of the night one time and. Uh, Dra skull dragging them onto the back of a trailer and uh, s seeing what they can rebuild for themselves. Yeah, because... I was going to say. I mean, this is th these things are, are actually worth a bit these days. I'm uh, I'm a little yeah, surprised yeah. they've got them there. Mm. Yeah, well, I was talking uh, to the uh, there's an antique shop at a little town a bit further along called Inglewood. I was talking to the guy that runs it. He sells a lot of motorbikes and car parts and that sort of thing. And he said the farmers apparently had these forever, just refuses to sell them. Um, whether he's sold, you know, uh, quite a few, as you suggest, that, um, you know, at one point they may have been up to a couple of hundred. Um, but these these core seats seem to just not be budging other than moving to one side for the building of this uh, this petrol station. Now, for the, the benefit of people who aren't Australians or even, you know, Australians who, like me, don't leave the cities very often, um, I've done the drive to South Australia twice in my life, literally once out and once back. Um, can you just explain what's involved in this commute, which for you is quite regular, but it's um, it's pretty Mad Max territory for a lot of people? Yeah, look, it's... I once heard... Uh, a, a ranger in a national park not too far from here described the landscape as mamofa so miles and miles of f all okay. because there's just nothing um you know on the on the sort of victoria new south wales side of murrayville you go through the hay plains and you drive through about three hours of just desolate i think oh, this... it's cotton fields because i remember driving through one year and just all this mm. cotton uh, it's been you know, it's been rice and moving to cotton and whatever they can grow with uh, terribly extracted water. But let's let's move on from that. Yeah, uh, the, the yeah, hay yeah, plains is is a long dri long boring drive. It's Honestly, unbelievable. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> Hay's one claim to fame is that once a year they hold the annual the annual mini nationals um, for the old uh, Morris minis. So oh, you nice. get a couple of hundred mini enthusiasts uh, meeting in Hay because it's about halfway between Adelaide and Sydney and they all descend on the town and it's mini mania. Um, but yeah, look, there's, there's a lot of little towns, but a lot of abandoned towns because, um, you know, over the years, people have just drifted from these little towns to the cities. To, to give a sense of just how flat and uh, the Hay Plain is and, and unremark, you know, there's no geography to speak of. I remember once trying to um, overtake a car um, out there and pulled out, saw headlights approaching, pulled back in, and I think it was a good 15 minutes before the car I'd seen oncoming actually went past because uh, that road was just <laughs> unbelievably straight and flat. Uh, so at, at here, we've got this town, Murrayville, and I've obviously never driven the Mallee Highway. I have gone across the Hay Plain a few times, but um, I just feel, Hugh, someone should be shooting a movie uh, finale out here, you know, chasing the, um, you know, for some sort of uh, outback horror. I mean, it's definitely got Mad Max vibes. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, not too far from here, there's, um, there's a national park with, I think they call it the Pink Lakes, or the, the basically pink... Uh, pink salt salt plains, um, which is pretty picturesque. But, um, you know, after you've been driving, for, I mean, the drive itself usually takes me about 14 to 16 hours. So, yeah, yeah. any excuse for a stop is usually uh, usually a good one. <laughs> yeah, but you don't stop too often, do you, in that um, 14 hours? It's, uh, it's pretty solid driving. Yeah, you just sort of stop for fuel or tanks. 
Or both in this case. <laughs> or stop for the tanks and the fuel and, and, and not a human to be seen. So do you prepay or do you uh, you have to prepay, I'd assume? Um, I actually didn't use it, to be honest. I just sort of parked yeah, my right. car up and made it look like I was uh, using it so that no one would uh, <laughs> raise any eyebrows. Because I... Do, I um, are there restrooms there? No, it's literally just like two... Well, yeah, two big like tanks not not the vehicle mm. tanks like fuel tanks um, sense, yeah. and yeah a little um a regular sort of bowser with just mm -hmm. a, a card pad to pay on and, yeah right and uh what what appears to be five uh, m3 lees and uh, a matilda sitting across the road from it with a bunch of uh, broken down parts in between and some grain and some, silos yeah yeah and some grain silos they they're like Two sides of the one uh, little field, but yeah, as you can see in this photo, there's there's plenty of plenty of parts and stuff floating around, and I bet what if you uh, if you go through some of that field, I'm sure you'd find more and more parts, but you'd probably also find a few brown snakes, I reckon. <laughs> plenty of snakes. I think if I needed drive sprockets for my uh, M3, I could uh, chase out the brown snakes. They'd be uh, mm. more afraid of me than vice versa. Mm. Uh, but okay, here, moving on from um, the Murrayville wreckage, uh, as a guest of the show, um, can you tell me what your favourite beer of the moment is? My favourite beer? Because you are coming to us from Ooh, Berlin, that's... so a town that's Yeah, closest. yeah. Look, there's a lot of uh, festival beers that are coming coming out at the moment. Yeah. Um, in uh in germany so i was in kaufland the other day which is sort of like an even cheaper version of little and there were these nice little festive beers that have some spices and stuff in but um my absolute favorite beer comes from bridge row brewery um and they they have this they have a series well they're they're in beechworth um which is oh i should have looked this up is that new south wales or victoria Victoria. Victoria, yeah. Victoria. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on the way, but yeah, it's it's sort of on the way between um, Sydney and Melbourne. And they do this yeah. incredible, well, they, they've done a series of beers. They're sort of named variants around sort of magical rainbow unicorn and, <laughs> and um, that sort of thing. But they're blonde stouts and they are fantastic. Um and white stouts are one of the weirdest beers you'll ever drink because they look like a lager or a pale ale and then it's full stout flavor yeah so good and there's because i probably only go there maybe once a year there's usually a variant of the previous years but they usually put out an addition for easter and another one for christmas and they're sort of spicy they're they're fruity but they're stouty but like you said john they're just they're just weird but but right in all the best ways <laughs> nice one now uh before we let you go Hugh, you're gonna have to tell us about your favorite tank honestly i'm a bit of a fan of the mark one oh, sorry the mark four which is okay yeah i guess pretty similar to the mark one <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh <laughs> Important refinements yeah, along the way, but um, the tank yeah, that could barely beat an A7, though. Barely beat an A7. But it could still beat an A7. Mm. <laughs> and did you see the uh, the Mark IV in, in, in the Trelaw Centre? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, when I was working out there, we uh, we got to go out there occasionally. Um, I also seen the one at Bovington. That's pretty cool. Um, Bovington, I mean, they've got a Mark I at Bovington. That, that's there. a replica. a replica. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a replica? To be yep, fair, yep. it was like 10 years since I was out of Bovington. Sure. We all need to go back. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, no, look, my dad's from Lincoln. So um, right in the on one of the roundabouts as you're heading up to the steep hill, which is where all the interesting stuff in Lincoln is. They've got a big, big monument to the tank building of um, that occurred in Lincoln during the First World War. Um, yeah, right. So, yeah. A big sort of uh, silhouette of a Mark One, and um, I just think the Mark Fours—they were just, uh, by modern standards, they were just so slow and so bad. I mean, top speed of something like six miles an hour. 
Yeah, I mean, it was the the the, the British phase which carried on with the Churchill of, um, hey, we can uh, put a tiny engine in these things and gear it low enough and it'll trundle very slowly eventually where it's going. Keep up with the infantry. <laughs> I mean, they, look, they were adaptable. They were, um, you know, they had a big effect at, at Cambrai. And, um, yeah, I just think they're really interesting. And the fact that they're so rare and hard to come by, I think just sort of adds to the intrigue. It's a classic British thing. They build a lot of these things and then they sell them all for scrap steel and then everyone's like, hang, hang on, history. Uh, <laughs> let us let us not speak of the British battleships. Um, but uh, yeah, All the aircraft. Yes. Yeah, although, I mean, they still got the Lancaster flying, though, so that that's something. But, um, yeah, soon to, soon to be a second one. A se okay. All right. <laughs> And they've um, the Canadians have said that once the second one is up and flying, they're going to bring theirs over. So we might see three Lancasters flying in formation. See, when we talked to the chieftain, he he was making the point that you know when you when you put up a hurricane and it's flying and something goes wrong, a you've lost the only flying hurricane you've got. B a pilot's going to die. Um, whereas when a, a, a tank is going around a, tack, a, a track at Tank Fest and something goes wrong, it stops and it, it's <laughs> fine. <laughs> you get the you get the arm out and you uh, drag it off and go fix, figure it out. Yeah, it's 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 a tough thing with because you know the, these Lancasters are such incredible um, artifacts and and historical things that, and to risk them with flight time. On the other hand, to to see them flying is so incredible. It's it's a real tough balance for folks. Yeah, and I was lucky enough to see one fly uh, for the Queen's 70th Jubilee. And yeah, right. just the sound of those four Merlins overhead, I mean, mm. it was sort of uh, goosebump territory. Yeah, I bet. I mean, even one Spitfire flying overhead is something you'll never forget. But, um, yeah, a Lancaster would really be something. All right. Um, Hugh, thank you so much for your time. You have um, wonderfully acquitted the purpose of this segment, which is to let Rob and I dash up the stairs and um, go to the toilet in the middle of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Right, well, we, thanks uh, for having me. We, we, do we truly do appreciate you sending through the pictures from Murrayville because I don't think a yeah, lot of lovely. Um, people quite understand um, what a bizarre scene is out there. So uh, we really, really appreciate that. And thank you for your time coming on to talk to us about it. Yeah, definitely worth the drive. Um, if it's you're going just something else. <laughs> I, I think it's worth the drive if I'm going to Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. All right. All right. Thank you. Cheers, Hugh. Thanks, Bert. See you.